Welcome, Jake. Welcome to the channel. It's good to be able to finally talk. This is uh, something we've waited for for months. So I'm really glad we can make it happen. Yeah, me too. Definitely been looking forward to this ever since the uh, we've talked before. I mean, besides on Instagram, which we obviously talk on Instagram, uh, but we talked on um, on Dale's channel. Yeah, we I know that was the, fantastic. Yeah, that was really fun. And that was like a year and a half ago now, actually, now that I think about it. So... <laughs> Yeah, and a ton has changed. I mean, like, for both of us, but even just like on my end, like, at the time, you guys were like, hey, Dave, when are you going to get a leather jacket? Or like, when are you yeah. going to get some engineer boots? <laughs> and like, yep. that, yeah, so much has changed. So, yeah. Yeah, that's true. You got, you've had two, well, no, four leather jackets now, right? Is it four or five, actually, with the vintage ones you got? See, it's five. Yeah. Yeah, five now. Yeah. So you have as many as I have right now. <laughs> that. That's unbelievable, but uh, yeah. I know you're Actually, kind of in no. flux. Technically, you have more than me right now. I'm, I, you have, I have four in the closet. You have five in the closet. I only have four right now. So Wow. Yeah, so that's a big change. I also got married since then, so that's a yes. big change. <laughs> yeah, so uh, I've told you several times already, but officially right here on the channel, congratulations. That's pretty amazing. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Appreciate that. Yeah. Yeah, that's really cool. Yeah, and I enjoy it not to get, you know, off on a sidetrack right at the beginning, but it's like um, I enjoy seeing your guys' relationship because you guys seem to have a really healthy relationship. And it's just I think that's a real big encouragement and a kind of a breath of fresh air for a lot of people. So that's that's it's cool. It's cool, especially now she's in Amakaji as well. And so you get to see oh, yeah. more of it. Yeah. 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 We feel like we do. <laughs> anyway. Yeah. yeah. Now, she she was she's uh she was ribbing me a little bit. She's like I was like, she's like, uh, okay, so this be, you know, what, what's the subject? And I was like, uh, I think it's just me, kind of, because he sent me like interview questions. He just interviewed me about a bunch of stuff. He's like, oh, okay, well, it shouldn't take too long. Oh, never mind. It's you answering questions. It'll probably take a while. Never mind. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Yeah. It, she's not wrong. That's the thing. She's not wrong at all. Well, and it's like how it goes when you're talking to someone that shares a passion, right? Mm -hmm. it, you know, it can kind of tend to go along. So yeah, we'll obviously be sensitive to time, but yeah, I don't, I don't think it's going to be a 15 minute talk. <laughs> no, <laughs> I don't want, I wouldn't want it to be. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, totally. So I guess to kick it off in the realm of Amakaji stuff um, to kind of, you know, steal one from you. Cause you guys do this on your podcast a lot, you know, any latest and greatest pickups or, or things you're planning on picking up or orders coming in or anything you're excited about? No, honestly, not for me, at least. Um, trying to replace a couple other jackets. I guess the newest one that I got that's been really cool is, but it's not that new, is my, the 60s, I think it's a 60s or 50s vintage cow that I got from a buddy of mine. I think you probably know him, Coastal File. Yeah, on Instagram, I know him from the Fedora Lounge as well, like the outer wedge section on the Fedora Lounge. Nice. Um, good guy. He was nice. I sold him jackets, and he was nice enough to just send it to me as a gift. So, arguably, my best fitting jacket that I've ever owned was free. <laughs> <laughs> it's really cool. Um, so I was like, I couldn't believe it. I was surprised, and I was surprised how much I ended up really loving that. So it, it definitely gave me a lot of uh, a greater appreciation for vintage jackets, partly just because of how short it is. Um, like even it's an interesting thing, like with that jacket. And there's also the Vanson that I got pretty recently that was like 250 bucks. So I've like kind of come full circle and gone to like gone from all these like freewheelers jackets to more recently been picking up these like, you know, cheaper or free like kind of older and, and vintage jackets just for fit reasons and they've worked out really really well um and the interesting thing is like the jackets like they fit even shorter than the measurements like because you know like you do like the back measurement um and that's a certain height or whatever and then you do like the front measurement that's a certain height and these feel even shorter than they actually measure and they look shorter than they measure and that's Kind of great for me because I'm not very tall and I also wear very high rise stuff and I always tuck everything. So, yeah, I guess that's the the coolest new pickup 
is uh, the sixty like, vintage cow police jacket. So that's the one for me, I guess. Recently, yeah, I've been loving your posts with both of those. Uh, so yeah, definitely props on that. I can see why you love them so much. What about you? Oh man, let's see. You got, well, you've gotten a lot of good stuff recently. I mean, you just posted the roll club video. I watched that whole thing while I was doing my workout today. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Um, let me think here. Yeah. It was one of those things. This has probably happened to you before where you like order all this stuff, you know, a year ago or whatever, mm -hmm. and it's not supposed to come at the same time, but like this order gets delayed and this one comes early and then it all just dumps yep. like within a month's time. I did have that happen. I think last summer. I had it. And actually, no, I did have, did I have it? Yes, I did have it happen recently too. Uh, now I think about it. My replacement benzene engineers and my motor engineers came at not exactly the same time, but I opened them at the same time, like almost the same time. So yeah, it, it, it happens fairly often. It's kind of funny. Yeah. Yeah, that's cool. So let me see. I got, yeah, I got the roll clubs, which, you know, despite some of the things on the video that I was like, ah, this is underwhelming. Um, they're right here. Yeah, I'm I'm super blown away. They're just they're amazing. Like I'm I'm glad that uh I mean a lot of people talked about them, but when I ordered them, it was because I had heard people talk about them and you've talked about them a ton. And then I think it was a blog post of yours where you like finally reviewed them or something after a long time or something like that. And at the end you said something like the wait is really long, but it's worth the wait, you know? Mm -hmm. And I was like, all right. So then I went on like the next day and contacted Brian and uh, yeah, it's one of those things you just don't realize how awesome it is until you experience it, you know? Yeah. yeah. There's definitely certain things like that. And I'm, I'm glad you pointed out all the flaws. Like that's important. That's why, you know, I actually watch your review videos. I don't watch everybody's review videos and I watch yours because you point out, everything and that's really important so i'm glad you did that but you still give like your overall impression this is a really good video honestly really that was i really liked that one um it's almost kind of like ordering like your first leather jacket probably too you don't know what it's like until you experience it for the first time i would assume do you <laughs> yeah. agree with that oh totally because the way everyone describes it is like perfect you know, like whether it's like, oh, it's heavy, it feels like body armor, you feel like a badass, whatever. And so it's not that I doubted that they were telling the truth. It's just that you don't realize just how true that is yeah. <laughs> until you do it. And you're like, oh, dude, you really do feel like a badass or it really does feel like body armor, you know, that kind of thing. So, really there, yeah, there's something about a leather jacket like you, even if you're not, you feel cooler than everybody else when you have one on. I think it's kind of the same thing for guys that like to wear like really good suits. Like if you have like a bespoke suit, you feel cooler than everybody else probably. Yeah. I would assume it's kind of like that just in a different way, but like similar sort of idea, I, I would think. And honestly, I feel like it's inspiring to people. No one's told me this, but just judging by the way people ask like, Oh, what jacket is that? Or like, or whatever, because I think many people want to wear stuff like that, mm -hmm. but, I mean, and I was like this too, um, like people are, are full of self-doubt, you know, and they're just like, oh, I can't do that. You know, it's pretentious or whatever. Um, I'm not cool enough. And I think it's kind of inspiring to people because they're like, oh, maybe I could like wear something that I want to wear, whether it's a leather jacket or something else. But yeah. Agreed. No, it's, it's uh, a good and bad thing that I've never, not that I don't have self-doubt in other areas, but like in terms of clothing, I've just don't have that it's sort of like when people say like the reason like racing drivers are so good because i watch f1 really closely oh yeah the racing drivers they just don't have that thing in the back of their head saying what if i crash what if i crash what if i crash they just don't have that that's the reason why they're able to go as fast as they go around these turns and stuff like that right it's like when you're wearing clothes like people i've had i've had tons of people tell me oh i can't pull engineer boots off i just don't think i'm cool enough i don't think i'm cool enough to wear leather jackets at all or this type of leather jacket even like people will get to like oh cross zips i'm not cool enough to wear that etc i just never had that whether or not i'm actually <laughs> cool enough to wear any of that stuff i just never thought about it that way i'm just <laughs> nice. like i like this i'm going to wear it. now of course i'm not going to show you all my 
you know, I, I'll do my like comparison posts where I have like the older, like less well dressed Jake and newer, I think better dressed Jake. That's nothing compared to Jake from ten years ago, where I dressed like where I dressed my teenage attempt at dressing like American Idiot era Green Day. Okay, and I dressed like <laughs> absolute garbage, and it's embarrassing and horrible. But I just didn't think about that. I just had the confidence to go for it. And I did all of that. And that's how I learned to dress better. Kind of feel like you have to do that. You kind of have to dress. I feel like sometimes, at least for me, this is how it works. You dress a little bit like an idiot before you dress well. So it worked for me, I think. I'm not saying I'm the best dressed person in the world. I'm not at all. Like I put people like Ethan Newton up way ahead of me. That's always the first guy I think of when I think of like perfectly stylish. Um, but like, at least I'm decent. I think I'm decently dressed enough and that's how I did it. <laughs> Jumping in, right? Yeah. Jumping no, I in Ethan first. Well said. Cause I, I think it was Ed Sheeran and he's talking about music, but it's all an art form, right? He talked about how with inspiration, it's almost like an old faucet. If you're writing songs or trying style out, like you got to turn the faucet on. And the first thing that comes out is a bunch of old rusty water. And you just kind of have to do it. Like you got to get past that. And then once that waters out, you know, once the bad styles out and stuff or the bad music, like then good things begin to happen and it takes time, but it, you know, and that's almost, a good point. No, it's yeah. true for music too. Cause I mean, I, I play drums and you play music too. Yeah. And you know, the first bands I was in, you were terrible <laughs> <laughs> and, but you, you got to do it. And then it gets better and better. And honestly, the same you know, the lead singer slash lead guitar player of the first band I was in, we played for years and years, and now he does music professionally, right? And, we, you know, we were in those same terrible early bands together. You have to, if you don't, you have to dive in with all the enthusiasm and uh, not, you still have to learn from your mistakes and, you know, figure out what you're doing wrong and get better. But it's, you have to dive in basically head first for a lot of things, I feel like. I'm glad you brought up the music. Uh, because I think there is a connection there, like what you said about the F1 drivers. Like, So this isn't deterministic, right? But I think you could draw a correlation between like you're a drummer and like you have to have certain personality traits to be a good drummer. Like, like you can't really care about making a mistake. Like nobody wants to make mistakes, but you're like super loud on stage, right? So it's like, if you're timid, like you just can't play. So you have to be like balls to the wall. And then if you were an electric guitarist, I feel like a good lead guitarist kind of has to be like this trigger happy sort of flamboyant. Look at me, look at me kind of guy, you know, like, like they can, like some of my best friends are lead guitarists and, you know, sometimes it can be, you know, kind of like self-centered and stuff. It's like, but Hey, that's what makes them so good at playing lead lines is. Yeah, no, you know. it's, <laughs> Yeah, no, there's like certain personalities that most like racing drivers have. There's certain personalities that different musicians have. Um, yeah, I agree that, yeah, drumming. The thing is with the drummer is you always have to be solid and just push through everything because the thing is with being the drummer is no matter who makes the mistake, they will. the audience will always think it's your fault. <laughs> I don't know if you've noticed that, but like unless it's like a wrong, like, like the singer's hitting a wrong note, other than that, like – unless they're actual musicians, they will, oh, the audience will always think it's the drummer's fault because the drummer is the one keeping the time. So you have to make sure that no matter what everybody else does, you're doing the right thing. So yes, you do have to have kind of a, a weirdly forceful personality as a drummer because you kind of have to say, no, 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 I'm right. I'm in the right time. You're in the wrong time. Yeah. <laughs> kind of thing. Yeah, totally. totally. And, and so again, it's, it's probably not deterministic, but I think, perhaps because you're a drummer like you carry that into your style and stuff and that is kind of enabled you to try out new things and all that and not get too hung up on like you know hey can i do this can i not you know so yeah yeah there's a lot of those weird connections like have you noticed how many guys who make jeans used to or still do skateboard oh yeah yeah it's, it's well over 50 percent of them they almost all either build cars or skateboard. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not kidding. No, you're totally Real right. No. Builds cars in his spare time. Connor Sewing Factory builds cars in his spare time. Uh, Samurai, big car collector as well. Um, uh, Amos from Grease Point Workwear skates. Roy skates. 
uh, Michael Masterson, I think he used to skate. I know he's big in graffiti. Um, I forget actually if he skated or not. Now I think about that one. Not sure about. Um, I'm pretty sure there's others though too. Like, oh gosh, now I'm blanking on them. But I know there's like a bunch of like denim makers who. Oh, Via Piana. I think Via Piana also skated it. I think he used to skate too. You have to go back to our podcast on. I can't remember, but I just know. See, I'm forgetting all this stuff now. But I know there's a bunch of them that like skateboard. It's like a a weird thing where tons of like denim makers skate or something like that. Oh, or totally. cars. Yeah, there's. Yeah, I don't know. I just I don't know how accurate it is, but just one of those things where you kind of notice it. So like, oh, there's a lot of them that do that. Yeah, I don't remember the exact names either. I just remember yeah, a lot of your podcasts and stuff. Hearing a bunch of people say that, and then. I think like Sons of Salvage too, like they they talk about like their hobbies and stuff and a bunch of those guys, you know, they, they tinker around with that stuff. So yeah, crazy, totally crazy. Um, so I was hoping we could kind of go back in time a little bit and see your perspective on what things were like when you first got into Amakaji because, you know, I don't know if it feels like a long time ago to you, but like, I feel like the community was a much, much was much smaller back then and it's just really blowing up now. So a lot of us have only been in it for like, you know, two, three years. And so that makes anybody that's been in it for like seven, eight, nine, ten years like a veteran. Um, so what was the Amakaji world like when you first got involved with it? And and how did you get connected with it? That's actually a really cool question because it is now that I think about, I mean, more recently I've been thinking about how long I've been into this and it does, it's, it's longer than I thought. Um, so I want to say I first started getting into this eight or nine years ago now. Yeah. Probably nine years ago was when I first started getting into this. Probably when I first got my, so I was probably starting researching it about 10 years ago and then nine years ago is when I first got into it. So yeah, 2011, 2012. And it was obviously, there was a scene before that. I mean, there's people around that are still around that you could ask that that would know even more than me that have been into it even longer. Um, but so what I remember at that time, the way I got into it, and I've talked about this before, but the way I got into this type of clothing was actually not through denim first. It was through hats and leather jackets first. So um, I got on places like the Fedora Lounge first. Um, and then right after that, I started, because I guess for me, I've always considered like the entire outfit. Um, so I wanted to get, you know, better quality, everything basically. And so that's how I kind of got into the denim part of it too. Um, and I think I got onto, I think the two places that I really got onto first were like super future, super denim, that forum and then denim bro so those were the kind of the two ones and i don't think i i didn't join right away but i would read through like threads and threads like full like all the way back to the beginning of certain threads for for those forums to just learn more and more and more stuff and so at that time see the other thing is i you can't if I'm wrong on this, people can correct me in the comments, you know, other, other veterans can, can, and more veteran people than me can correct me on this. But back then, so this is like 2012 to 2014 was when I was first getting into it. Um, a lot of people thought Viberg was the best bootmaker in the world. That was like a big thing. Um, and then like John Lofgren engineers were like the other, like they were kind of a big grail. Right. Um, there's no, there wasn't Roll Club yet, at least at the very beginning. I think Roll Club was just coming on the scene. Maybe at the, t I forget exactly when, but that was like a very new thing. Clinch was not quite there yet. Um, some people had heard of White Cloud, but almost nobody had heard of White Cloud at that point. I mean, he was already making stuff by then, but that was kind of to the side. So it was like the boot world especially is completely different now than what it was back then. I feel like not, I mean, I guess not a hundred percent different. I mean, there's still tons of Red Wing fans. That's still a thing. But like <laughs> the Indonesian boot scene was not what it is today. It's definitely not as influential as it is today. Nobody would have touched a Chinese boot with a 20 foot pole back then. And look at, you know, where we've come at this point, like you got tons of 
like there's several really high quality Chinese bootmakers at this point that um, I think are very much worth supporting. So that's very different. Engineers have absolutely blown up, but that's even more recent. That's another change. Um, back then, like the, the way people did denim and fading was also different. I think style was different. So I would say back then, higher contrast fades were definitely more in, if I remember correctly. It's definitely a bigger deal. I feel like heavyweight denim was more popular. The other thing about this, though, that I've learned over the years is none of this stuff ever completely goes away, actually. It's also this niche, I think, now and is big enough to the point where, and I, I don't want to say it's getting bigger, but I think it's also because of like the social media and all that stuff and YouTube and all this other stuff, it's kind of like different subcultures and different like branches of it have kind of connected in a weird way. I'm trying to make this make sense. I'm not sure if I'm doing this justice, but like we've kind of realized that like, like there's you, I don't know if you would have used to have been able to make a connection between like Bryceland's like, do you know who Bryceland's and like Ethan, Ethan are like those guys are? No, not really. I mean, okay. I've seen like things so, here and there. Bryceland's is, uh and if you can look him up on instagram like ethan newton he's like a really stylish guy he's i forget it. i think he's american i can't remember but he lives in japan started a, a a store there and it's mostly more sartorial stuff like he wears a lot of like odd trousers and and sport coats and stuff like that and that sort of thing but also wears like raw denim and has engineer boots and has I think he's got a vintage Buko leather jacket and he's done collaborations with Dave Himmel, right? That's that sort of thing. And then now Standard and Strange sells Bryceland's products. And so there's people that would have never worn like the more sartorial stuff that, that guys like Ethan and Kenji, I think that's the other, one of the other guys that's from Bryceland's, um, like they go to Pity Womo and Standard and Strange also sells them. And then there's guys that have never heard of Pity Womo that are wearing that are probably wearing Bryson stuff, right? And that degree of connection, I don't know. Maybe that can that sort of degree of connection between all these different like types of style existed back then, but I don't feel like we were as aware of those connections as we are now. Uh. Or I just wasn't. That's the other thing. Because so one of the other weird things is like because you got to understand at that time. I'm very new at the scene. So the way I looked at the scene back then is very different from how I look at the scene now. And of course, I'm looking at a slightly different scene now than it was back then. So I know, does that make sense? Like, oh, yeah, there's totally. somebody who was a veteran already in 2012, right? Who had already been into the scene for 10 years, let's say. Then they'd be able to give you a more objective look at how the scene has changed. I'm telling you more of how my perspective of, on how the scene of how my perspective on the scene has changed, right? So, like, my experience with this type of clothing has changed over those, you know, eight or nine years or whatever it is, right? So, it's a very bi. Like my story of this is going to be very biased, but I also think it's kind of interesting because that's true for all of us. Like, no matter who we are, I think almost all of us, it's the scene is deep enough now. There's enough people. There's enough ways to experience this type of clothing and all that stuff that your perspective is definitely going to change like a lot over time. Like, I feel like, I don't know if this is true just because I got into this type of stuff old, when I was older, but like my perspective on clothing and how I like interpret this scene or lifestyle, or whatever has changed more than my perspectives on drumming did over like my career as a drummer. And they did change a lot. Trust me. Like I used to, you know, I, I hear a worship Travis Barker at the beginning and now my favorite drummer is, Steve Jordan, right? And so that's <laughs> completely different styles. Not that I don't appreciate Travis Barker also, but like that's a pretty big change, but it's nothing to how my perspective on like uh, like clothing and style and how this sort of scene operates has changed. Like I never got as jaded about drumming <laughs> as, as I am about certain <laughs> aspects of, of Amakashi and clothing and stuff like that. Not that... It, Although there's also a lot of positives, of course, too. But like, there's certain things I've gotten more jaded on as a as a result of being in this for so long. 
So I don't know. I don't know if that really answered your question, but like, I guess again, make it more simplified. I guess another way to put it, and again, this is my perspective. I could be totally wrong. The way most people like you think of, like me think of a standard Amakaji guy on Instagram is closer to how people dressed back then on like the forums and stuff like that. Um, whereas nowadays, actually I haven't been on the forums in a while. I, I probably last really was taking them seriously about a year ago, but they definitely switched like a lot. So like nowadays, uh, vintage phase are definitely more in, uh, wider cuts are definitely getting more popular, even though, again, that's the thing. Skinny cuts are always going to be popular because for some reason, men think that skinny fits make them look skinnier. Even though it's like not true at all. Uh, but, but that's what like people are still going to, you know, skinny jeans are always going to be popular. Um, and there, I, I, I guess the other thing that's difficult about this type of the scene, we don't have the hard numbers for most of these brands to know if it's actually more popular or not. Right. It's, it's funny. Like one of the guys who like I most respect um, in this scene, I don't even know if you know him because he's been inactive for so long is uh, Indigo Shrimp. Uh, oh, he, I only know of him because you guys talk about him. And so I went yeah. and like searched the internet and started reading his stuff. But like, you no, know, yeah. like I've never talked to the guy cause yeah, he's not around. So yeah. So like he's a, he's really very intelligent guy. I think he's like a doctor, like a research doc, you know, he's, you know, he's, very, very intelligent dude, uh, really good writer. One of my favorite, probably my favorite you know, denim blog of all time. I would say it was my you know, favorite. And he would, he was near kind of the end of his run as writing. I think he stopped in 2019. He hasn't written anything since then. Um, he was always predicting like after the flathead went into bankruptcy and they came back, he was expecting like a lot more brands to like fail. And I kind of was too at that time. And I think other people were, and that just hasn't happened yet. So we keep thinking the scene's going to die and it just keeps continuing. And I think like, I don't know if this is true, but almost like, because there's so many people getting into boots from like the Reddit shoe scene, basically like that's feeding the, the Amakaji people. <laughs> like cause those Reddit shoe guys coming in and, and trying and getting like, Vibergs and then Lofgrens and then Indonesian boots. And they're like, okay, I kind of need a pair of raw denim to wear with this. It just seems to be what we're supposed to do. Oh, look, I have a, <laughs> oh, look, I have three Roma Kois jackets now. That's kind of, I feel like, what's like feeding like the monster of this scene at this point. <laughs> That's the way it seems like now is, is you have, there's so many ways to experience the scene now. You've got forums, you've got um, YouTube, you've got Reddit, you've got, um instagram you've got discord basically like you the stitch down discord and all that stuff like there's so many more ways of communicating all this stuff now than there used to be where it used to be basically just forms and then in-person events right in-person meetings and now we have and plus we have in-person stuff again now so yeah i think that's really cool though that like it keeps i don't know how much it's a evolving but it's definitely um i think it's more it feels more complex now because like i said either there's more of those connections between different styles or we're just more aware of them like i said so that's the way i would kind of phrase it i guess like people kept saying raw denim was going to go away and it just never has like it was a big fad in like 2008, like, like I think I want to say like 2005, like maybe like 2008, 2009, when like all the streetwear people and like skate, I guess like even skateboarders and stuff like that would kind of wear it. And I'm pretty sure like, uh, didn't like Jay Z wear raw denim like on like at a tour? They saw him wearing stuff like that. That obviously doesn't happen anymore, but now it's, you know, these like sartorial guys will wear a pair of raw denim. Like they know they'll wear that instead of, diesel jeans or whatever i don't know stuff like that so yeah that's i guess how i'm looking at it i think boots have gotten like even bigger that's another thing i think that's like a really big one is just how big boots specifically have gotten yeah boots it's it's crazy it's just taking off i mean you got all yeah. these guys now making their own boots which shows you that there's just a lot of demand because there's no way those guys could like quit their day jobs and start making boots if there wasn't like a bajillion people <laughs> trying to buy them, you know? 
on top yeah. of the companies we already have. So exactly. And that's, and that's just in, uh, I mean, I've only been doing this barely four years. And even in just that time, there's like way more brands and guys that are one man shops starting their own thing and all this stuff. So, so that's probably another thing is like, I really found your perspective fascinating because like you're talking about a time where I wasn't there, but then recognizing that even in the time I have been around, things have just changed so fast and they develop so fast. Like I'm baffled that like, I've only had the channel for like two years and there's already videos that are outdated that I've had to go change to unlisted, you know, mm -hmm. just cause it's like, that doesn't, either because my perspective changed and I'm like, Oh, I can't believe I said that. I got to get that video off the internet, <laughs> you know, or, or just it's irrelevant. Like that, like that thing that I said mattered then and it just like literally doesn't matter anymore. So I just need to get rid of the video, you know? Um, so who back then, who were some of the big retailers? Cause right now oh. there's, there seems to be a lot, but, back then there's probably less so yeah who were there selfish you said Self -edge. so the interesting thing is the way i one of the ways you can distinguish the eras of denim in my opinion I, i'm not saying this is completely true but there is there is the era and this is before you probably got in when i got in self edge was who dictated denim style whatever self edge brought in was the cool hyped brand now it's obviously standard and strange. Not oh, yeah. that self edge isn't successful now, right? And it's not like they don't have any influence. I'm not saying that it's not to disparage self edge. I think, you know, I still will go to self edge. It's, they still bring in a lot of like popular brands, obviously, right? They, their stores are all still operating. It's just that at least from like the consumer perspective, when I got into this, like self edge was bringing in all the hype stuff. So like when I first got in, when I was doing my research before I even started buying stuff, the flathead was like the thing they were the hotness for sure um and iron heart obviously but iron hearts have been pretty consistent right like there will always be iron heart fanboys right um but i think the flathead especially at the beginning they were really really popular and huge and i feel like um they were just like the coolest brand and that's not this and then 316 as well they are still popular, but I don't feel like they are as influential, like to overall on the scene as they were back then, I guess, if that makes sense. And again, not trying to dis disparage them or, or anything like that. Um, like I still have some cool shirts from 316 that I really like, but just like in terms of who's dictating, like who's the trendsetters, I guess I would say. And I feel like now Standard and Strange is the trendsetter. And you can see that in the different styles, right? Like Standard and Strange is a bit more boot oriented. They're a bit more wider cut a little bit, a little bit more tuck your shirt in, a little bit more Western, a little bit more refined. Self Edge is a little bit more slim, skater, fashion forward, um, eclectic, I would say. Um, that's less a little bit less sartorial and not in a negative way just like in a more you know casual streetwear way right i think selfage is more streetwear and 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 standard and strange is a little bit more western and a little bit more classic or also you could think about it as like selfage is a little bit more 50s and like into like i don't know like and then skater right and streetwear and selfage is sorry and standard and strange is a little bit more like 30s 40s and mm. older and that sort of thing right um like the big hype brand for for self edge was roy skater guy right and the not that his style reflected like, entirely on self edge that's not what i mean but like they were a bit more like I mean, like Rogue Territory and 316 were both like almost like semi streetwear brands. Like 316 started as a t shirt printing, like they started doing pretty t like graphic t shirts, I'm pretty sure, if I'm not mistaken. Right. That's totally different than like Motive Manufacture, Motive and Uo Yufokuten and that kind of stuff, which is what Standard and Strange does. Right. Like I look more like a Standard and Strange guy, not a self edge guy, like the way I dress. 
Oh yeah. Although it's not, I guess, you know, I dressed like this before I started shopping at Sanders Strange, but you get the idea, right? Oh, totally. Like, I mean, it's like if you go to Self Edge and you're like, okay, I'm going to drop whatever it is, 10 grand on repro stuff. Like you'll run out of stuff to buy pretty fast because it's not like they have none of it, but it's just not as much. You go to Standard and Strange though, and it's like you have they have re repro garments for days. Like all that's a good way to put it too. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Standard and Strange is more repro oriented and and repro adjacent kind of stuff, and then Self Edge is a little bit less repro oriented. Not that they don't have repro stuff because they do. Again, there's always those crossovers, but mm -hmm. it's not as much, and um. Like, I feel like I used to say even a couple of years ago that like the forums always started the trends before people on Instagram picked it up. So like when the forum guys switched from liking slimmer jeans to liking wider fits and liking more vintage phase rather than more high contrast phase, after a little while, then people on Instagram started to pick that up and at least became more popular, even if it's not the most popular. Now I feel like almost at this point, it's like, I don't know if that's as true anymore. I feel like there's other stuff. Now there's so many more avenues and channels that like there's multiple ways the scene's being influenced compared to how it used to be. Mm. But again, I don't know if that's true because like I said, that's my perspective has changed. Like how I'm experiencing this clothing has changed over that time. So kind of interesting. I mean, it's another one of those things where like if you buy some of those like denim books where they like talk about like important people in denim and stuff like that. And I still don't know who most of those people are. Like there are people that like just don't involve themselves in Instagram if at all, or, or even forums at all. And they'll just like, you'll see them at inspiration LA and maybe, and then they'll go off to their own vintage world. Right. And then that's all people like us. Like we, if you think about like the denim iceberg, we are still, you know, you and I are still maybe only at the second level. And there's like usually like, what five levels. We're still above the water. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, Oh, totally. Yeah, when I talk to a, like a real denim head, uh, yeah, I feel like the noob that I am. Yeah, <laughs> because yeah. there's just stuff that they know about and stuff they care about that I'm like, that's not even in my universe. And that's cool. Like, I love hearing them talk, but yeah, I'm just like, dude, I, man, you left me behind. So, yeah, totally. Yeah. Like, again, for me, like the whole clothing, like, everything matters to me. Like, that's one of the videos I want to do upcoming soon is like, why does everybody in the denim and Am Amakaji scene wear such poor quality hats? Why are people still wearing Goran Brothers? And what's the other one that everybody always wears? The other terrible hat company that makes wool hats that... Oh, I don't even know. Because you've got a lot of... Goran Brothers and there's one other one that I'm blanking on. But it's like, guys, you're wearing like $500, $400, $300 jeans, $1,000 boots... Right, at least seven hundred to two to three thousand dollar leather jacket, and you're wearing this piece of garbage hat on your head. <laughs> like, <laughs> please, rabbit hair at the minimum. Okay, it's not that hard. It's not that expensive. No, it's like, really not. Like my my Stetson is like not that special, but it gets you in the door, and it's like two hundred bucks. That's like not that much to spend. Yeah, it's not that much to spend to get a decent hat, right? Yeah, two hundred dollars will get you at least like the rabbit or rabbit beaver beaver blend Stetson. There you go. That's, it is, that's good enough. That's definitely good enough to at least to start or even depending on what you're doing to finish with, but at least that come on. So, you know, stuff like that, or like I, I always, again, this is, I don't know, me being a little snobbish, but like seeing people wear like a hat like this and a shirt like this with like Oakley glasses, <laughs> I'm like, uh, they don't have to be Jacques Marie Maj. They don't have to be Globe Specs. They don't have to be all over people's made in Japan. They don't have to be, um, twist, uh, they don't have to be Matsuda. They don't have to be that. But like, they don't have to be salt optics. But, you know, can they at least go together, please? <laughs> like, <laughs> I'm that way I mean, with people uh, shoes. People can do what they want. It's just like me as somebody, like the way I am with like how I like to dress and stuff like that. It's always confusing or off-putting to me now that's yeah. literally wrong right like you, you do what you want right? I, I always believe in freedom um of choice for everything but like that is just something that's kind of odd to me and and it's true like it's kind of funny like you see this in all the different scenes and i'm sure i've been guilty of this too i'm sure i probably still am guilty 
of stuff like this and somebody could point it out to me right um but like i'll go on the leather jacket forums and they'll have these super nice leather jackets and not this isn't true of all of everybody on the fedora lounge at all but some of them will just be dressed really poorly with like really crappy shoes really like just the worst shirts and this wonderful leather jacket and again if that's your experience if that's what you want to do that's great but it's just to me i cannot fathom that anymore it just doesn't and the funny thing is i did used to do that <laughs> like i can't relate to the old me because i used to, to at the very beginning i did kind of do that I, I used to not care about the shirts at all i used to wear pretty not great shirts with like like i would i got like these hand-me-down nordstrom shirts and they were super shiny and i would wear those with my first cafe racer jacket dude <laughs> So oh, I'm again, I did this myself. I have made these mistakes and it's just like, I cannot relate to that old version of me at all anymore. So, but there's, and there's people like that, right? Like the real denim heads are people that just like eat, sleep, breathe indigo, right? Like they bleed indigo, right? And there's some boot guys where like, even some of the ones that, okay, I'll get a pair of raw denim, but like everything else is boots, right? And then there's people like just leather jackets and, there's people like on the Fedora Lounge, like the actual hats were like, they, I don't think they wear anything else. It's just the hats. Not that everybody's like that, right? But it's interesting how some people are very laser focused on the thing they're into. And then there's other people that are kind of more into the whole thing. But it's fascinating. That's one of the things that keeps it interesting, right? Is all these different, again, like I kept saying, like these little intersections of all these different kinds of people and stuff. Kind of fun. Oh, yeah. You know, it takes all kinds. My, yeah. uh, my little similar pet peeve is like when somebody, regardless of which specific kind of style they have, if they have like style from like their head all the way down to their ankles and then they wear like athletic shoes, they have like their Nike running shoes on. It's yeah. just like, dude, what are you doing? Like, I just, I don't get that at all. They're like, they're comfortable. And I'm like, but dude, like, dude a lot Chuck of other 70s companies. minimum. They're not that expensive. They're probably <laughs> half the price of your Nikes. Just Chuck 70s minimum. Yeah. It's not that hard so funny yeah oh man so i guess something else from the past that I'm, i've been curious about so i'm still in the middle of reading amatora the book and it's it's an amazing book and i'll probably read it again because there's just so much to yeah. di digest right fantastic so book at what point in your amakaji journey did you read that and did it kind of give you this illumination where you know you like changed all your ways or whatever or was it more like you read it and it kind of slowly began to change your style was it like a big eye opener for you and like a turning point or how did that work out it is a great book man it's it's i love it and i did also have the privilege on one of my old podcasts of actually interviewing w david marks yeah um, which was remember that. awesome he's a really cool guy it was a really enlightening conversation as well um but yeah, I mean, it's definitely one of those things that every, you hear everybody say, it, everybody should read Amatora. Um, and I, when you, while you were asking that question, I was kind of thinking, I was kind of realizing what I just said at the beginning and kind of what I've been saying throughout this whole thing that we're doing right now about how these, all these interconnections that I wasn't as aware of at the beginning that I'm more aware of now, maybe a lot of us are more aware of now um, in this scene. I think that realization probably did come in a way from Amatora because in that book, and I need to read it again. I think have I read it twice already. I think I've read it twice now, but I need to read it again. Cause I, I, I read them like read like two times very quickly. Um, I think I read it in 2018 or 2019. I want to say. I'm trying to remember. You can, if you go back to when we interviewed W. David Marks on the old Denim and Boots podcast, which I want to say was 2019, maybe 2018, right? You know, a few months before that, or is when I started reading the book. Oh, okay. So that's that's what will date it. Um, so you can check for that release date on that, and that's when it is. So, but it was, I think, around that time, definitely before 20, a pretty positive before 2020. Um, and yeah, it was not like. I learned definitely a lot right away, but it's, I think it's more of an overtime thing when I kind of realized one of the cool things about Amatora for if, whether or not you've read it, 
for other people, you know, I know you're in the middle of reading it. Um, <laughs> you see these, he does a great job of like putting all these connections in with like between different styles and different types of clothing. And like, you know, when you really think about it, like the whole Amakaji thing, the Japanese saving American style thing, it wasn't just one style, right? Like they, you know, there's Ivy outdoors, clothing, um, streetwear you know more sartorial all that kind of stuff right it's it's all of it and um you know i mean for you know, again people a lot of people always forget this like remember the japanese are the reason red wing heritage exists they started red wing heritage yes red wing existed the entire time but red wing heritage is a distinctly japanese creation um and so and that's even more recent. I don't even know. I don't even think the book talks about that, which is fair. Like it's not really related to what he's, it's not as more tangentially related, but like that's in yet another example of like one of the things that like the Japanese kind of saved, right. In terms of American style is like even the work booth thing, because other than Viberg, there was, you know, Lofgren went to, he's American, but started his thing in Japan. And then you've got, um and maybe mr freedom too that would be it. but if it was just vibrig and mr freedom without would we would the scene be the same without without all the other stuff right and mr freedom has a lot of has a lot of their stuff with the sugar cane in japan so again there's always that japanese connection but yeah i guess like sorry i'm i'm rambling now but i think yeah it's an overtime thing where i realize how much it's impacted my understanding of this scene and lifestyle and hobby or whatever you want to call it, because I realized the, how interconnected all of the stuff is. And I think that's probably comes from, um, from Amatora. One of the things I learned from it anyway. Uh, when you started like your blog and you've done a few podcasts and stuff, why did you start them? Was it something that kind of happened overnight? Uh, did something prompted it. Was it like, you no, know, it was like vacuum. There was nothing like that at the time. You know, like why did you start the stuff and have this passion to start creating? Yeah, and the YouTube too, which part, which I'm shameless plug. I'm back on YouTube, not just yes. on the video, but like my YouTube channel is actually back. Yes, it's um, good too. I love it. But yeah, no, it, there there was a thing with that, and that was that at the time, I felt like there was tons and tons of knowledge on the forums right and in certain books and in a few very small few a couple of blogs but there really wasn't that much outside of that for other people to learn and like the way the forum guys acted and i you know i i stopped being on the forums recently uh is like people call me a gatekeeper, dude. I am nothing compared to forum guys, dude. <laughs> they are gatekeepers and a half. Like that, you can literally go back onto like Super Future, and they might still be just making fun of Instagram. Like they love to just crap on Instagram and make fun of Instagram and the denim people that are on Instagram. Like everything about it, they love to to trash on, and they just. I don't know if they only want their knowledge to stay on the forums, but they definitely, I mean, it's, it was elitist as heck. And apparently everybody I've talked to would tell me before I got on super, said, Oh dude, it was way worse before you got on here. <laughs> it was really bad. That place was like a nightmare apparently. <laughs> so, I mean, there's tons of knowledge on there. And like, honestly, like it, there's still a lot of stuff in like super feature and super and, and denim bro. But like, if you really want a deeper knowledge of denim, those are where you kind of have to go. Um, but I wanted to, because I did so much research on those places, like I want to try to bring some of the knowledge from there onto like YouTube and like a wider audience, basically. That was my idea. Um, like I've always been characterized as arrogant and like kind of a know-it-all and that's fair to a degree. But I never thought like I actually know more than everybody. It's like I always know there's people that are way better dressed than me and like are more knowledgeable in every single different aspect of this type of clothing than me, all that sort of stuff. But I will still maintain that like most 
YouTube boot reviews are garbage. They they just are. They're terrible. Most of them. Uh, a lot of them are really bad. Um, and they're done by people that don't know what they're talking about um and are just trying to get popular and they don't have the genuine passion for the the clothing and stuff like that so i'm somebody who's like kind of in the middle right i don't know as much as like the biggest forum nerds and like those guys i talked about that like will show up to inspiration and then go back into their own you know universe right and you know we're the worst for not knowing more about those people but i know more than these guys on YouTube that don't know what they're talking about. Right. And are just doing it for fun. So like, there's a lot of guys like on YouTube that will even say like, Oh yeah, I got into this through these other YouTubers. Like, yeah. So you got your knowledge from this guy that doesn't know anything. <laughs> and so now you don't know anything. Great. Okay. This is perfect. All right. Um, so that's why I did it honestly is to, and again, I made a ton of mistakes. Like, looking back on obviously i would have done it differently and i would have waited a few more years before i started i really would um and that's why my youtube videos are deleted my old ones are gone because they're not good enough um i was you know making a lot of mistakes and i'm still gonna keep making mistakes that's the thing um but yeah like that's why i can leave the blog articles up is because i can edit those i can improve them i can fix the the incorrect information and i can add stuff to them and, and all that kind of stuff. Like my, what happened to Viberg article, which is the one that kind of blew me up a little bit initially, not that I actually like got popular, probably, but you know what I mean? Like oh yeah, a lot of people to my blog, I've edited that thing like seven times over the years, like, and edited some of it pretty heavily to be more, and it needs another edit. Actually. I was just thinking about that while watching your Viberg review today, oh, okay, um, because I, I was working out long enough that I needed to watch both your videos today. So I watched your, um, the roll club video and then the Viberg review that you did. And you were talking about how like, you know, now it, you said like Viberg has probably the best bang for your buck boot right now. And I don't know if I quite agree with that, but you were talking about like how they do like the, like for factory boots, like the best, like welt and the best, you know, tightest stitch. And I'm like, I kind of hate, why am I, why am I mad at him saying this? Oh, it's because <laughs> of the they kind of do now. Oh, I got to go up to my article again. Oh, that's so I made funny. a meme and I forgot if I posted this one yet. It's one of the ones I'm most proud of. And it's like, um, you know, the the one of do- of like Jim Carrey as Dr. Eggman, like saying, I did not expect that. But I was expecting not to expect something so it doesn't count. <laughs> yeah. My caption above that, I don't know if I posted this meme yet, but it's um, when Viberg says they're going to improve their quality control and they actually do. <laughs> I wasn't expecting uh... that. But it, but because it's vibrant, I wasn't expecting to expect. I wasn't expecting to expect something, so it doesn't count. But it's true, like when because you did like vibrant always says like they've said for years they're going to improve their quality control. You know, I mean, as a vibrant fan, you know that, right? Oh they've yeah, totally. Been that yeah, they've been, they're going to improve their quality control, and they never did. And then this time they did. <laughs> Which is great. Honestly, I'm really happy they did. It's awesome. It's really cool that Viberg is now. I agree with you now. I think I have to agree with you. They are what they say they are now, which is awesome. I think that's really cool. And that's something that I don't know if you'd get with every scene. But I think that's a really cool story. And so now I have to go back and update that article. Um, now, do they still make really weird and dumb decisions, in my opinion? Like, and do they do like seem to actively like stomp on what their customers want? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. They do that. Like, I'm not the only one who think like, there's a lot of stuff that I wrote in that article that ended up being completely true. Like I was really proud of that article. Now obviously there's a lot of stuff that I was ended up being wrong about with that article. I didn't think they were ever going to improve their quality control. And here we are. Their stitch density is out of this world. It's fantastic. Now there's still mistakes. Yeah. But like, as you said, like for a factory boot, I found myself the past two months, like looking for a Viberg that I actually liked because the quality is good enough that I really want another pair. So yeah, I think that's cool. Um, yeah, I actually forget what question I was answering now at this point, but just like all this like random stuff like always pops <laughs> in my head. <laughs> no, cool. Me too, I forgot, but uh, it's okay because I just love, I love hearing you talk. Like, I'm having so much fun talking right now. Well, I'm not talking, <laughs> you're talking, but that's great. That's like why I'm here. So, oh man, this is- well, That's what my wife said was going to happen. It's I a blast. Right. 
they're, they're always right. Our wives are always right. <laughs> oh, that's so funny. Like I said, I wish I had waited a little bit longer because a lot of the stuff I put out back then I realized was really bad. Like I got some backlash on the forums and at first I like, you know, fought back and then I kind of realized, no, nah, they were kind of right. I did say some really stupid stuff. It was wrong. And I took credit for stuff that wasn't mine. Not like like, le like legal credit, but like, you know, didn't credit people in the right way that I should have, you know. So I did learn. But honest, at the same time, I also learned a lot from it. Again, it's kind of like the jumping in head first thing. Like I did learn a lot from it. But I do wish I waited a little bit more because I did it because I felt I was more knowledgeable at the time than I really was. You know what I mean? Um, so yeah i would i would change that but like i said the, the blogs is not as much, as much of an issue because i can edit them and i do I, I do edit a lot of them and i or i post update you know updates on stuff right but with the youtube videos and at least you know uh i deleted the ones the, all the old stuff that i don't think is as good now or as relevant so yeah see it's so so, so funny like because of when i came into it and i think also this is because i just have a personality where I give people the benefit of the doubt anyways. I was just like looking for good content and I found you. And like even the stuff that late like later I found out others look at as like inflammatory. I'd be like, dude, that's like my favorite video. Like it was so good. <laughs> you know, or whatever. And then like, yeah. So it was just really funny. And then uh you start meeting people and they're like they're like, oh yeah, that, that Chrome Excel video or whatever. Oh, that, drives me nuts. I'm like, well, why? You know, and then you start like learning more about the community and the context of everything. And um, yeah, it was just a, a fascinating thing. But all to say, I just, I always got a lot out of it. And, um, but I, I see what you mean too. Like you do grow and you change. And yep. I think, I, I don't want to say like, yeah, because it sounds funny saying this. I don't say like the community owes you or something like that, but I guess, the first guy through the door is the guy that gets all the bullet holes. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, like, I think you were the first guy that was trying to put out content that had some substance, and you were actually making an argument, saying something that was a bit challenging, something that was worthy of actual, like, debate and discussion, you know? And so, like, yeah, maybe there was ways it could have improved, but, like, that's the part I appreciate. I'm like, and so as soon as I got into the community, like I just started like devouring all of your content and any other stuff that like it that I could find, but there just wasn't as much stuff. Um, but yeah, you're the first guy through the door. So you're the guy that gets like the first magazine of Tommy gun bullets. <laughs> you know? Yeah. I think that might be true to be honest. Like not that there weren't people being more critical. Cause again, the forum guys were like that, but they weren't bringing it to the wider audience. They didn't want to most of them at least right so that's what i was trying to do and i guess in a way i don't know and again not saying it's due to me but like i do feel like the world i wanted is actually what we have now to be honest whatever is responsible for it if i played a part in it i'm i'm glad i did if i did you know i don't know how much but i do feel like right now especially in the past year i've noticed like people are more open-minded to having their favorite things criticized a bit more than they used to be, I feel like. Um, maybe not completely, but like I do feel like it's gotten a bit better, honestly. So I think that's kind of cool. Uh, I feel like there's, because there's all these different more perspectives coming around and stuff like that, there's definitely some issues with it still, but like it's, it's gotten better. Um, and I don't know who to credit for all of it, but like, you know, there's more critical content now than there used to be you know like you are a perfect example of that like um and i think even like uh dale has gotten more a little bit more critical in his videos than he used to be like i love dale's videos but you know we kind of talk like he's very very positive right but i think he's gotten a little more critical in some of his videos and i've seen people like just get more critical in general of certain things and have a better do a better job with dialogue of that stuff like on the stitch down discord server and instagram and stuff like that so yeah i think it has gotten better in that way and maybe slightly less tribalistic another question that i wanted to ask you was i guess 
why did it take so long for you to get into vintage leather jackets? Uh, was it something about vintage leather jackets that you're like, ah, I don't like this or that? Or was it really just that you're preoccupied with some of the other jackets that you were exploring for all the years before? That's a great question, honestly. And I'll be like, the reason I got into a vintage leather jacket is because a dude sent it to me for free. <laughs> <laughs> so I almost got like forced into vintage leather jackets because a friend of mine just sent one to me. And so for those of you who don't know what I'm talking about, uh, a, a buddy of mine, Coastal File on Instagram. Um, actually, I think his name is JCSD on the Fedora Lounge. Good friend of mine from the Fedora Lounge and, and, and Instagram and all that. Uh, really, you know, uh, well-dressed leather jacket dude. He had a like a 50s or 60s Cal CHP jacket that, you know, I've sold him a couple jackets and he just sent it to me kind of for free, like just as a friend. Um, and it fits me really, really well. Uh, it's a fantastic jacket and I love it. And I want to say he even asked if I wanted to buy it a while before that. And I was like, nah, I'm not sure, you know. And then he just let me kind of have it and it's fantastic and I love it. I'm like, and it's really opened my eyes in a lot of ways and changed my perspective on leather jackets in a lot of ways, uh, for sure. In a very short amount of time. I mean, anybody who's followed my Instagram over the past couple of months has like seen the the midlife crisis I've been going through with leather jackets <laughs> recently, right? Yeah. Um, which also was triggered by my weight loss and everything too, but it's like a bunch of stuff. It's like, oh, everything has changed with me with leather jackets. Um. So, but the thing that stopped me from doing it before is the same reason I haven't still gotten any more since then is two things. One, sizing, like lack of assurance on sizing, because like it, when a company measures the jackets, like when I'm buying from the company or stock, it's like feel more comfortable. Like I'm comfortable buying stuff online, but when an eBay seller is selling stuff, uh, I don't know as much. Like most of the time, if I'm buying stuff, I buy a lot of stuff used all the time. But you can also usually go back to like a store's measurements or the company's measurements or something like that. And then compare them to how the person measured it, right? So like when I buy stuff online, like I'll go like, oh, the standard if standard and strange and self-edge or whatever, like let's just say they both have this shirt, like two stores have this shirt, plus like the company provided measurements. I'll look at all three and see, okay, this is the right side. And then if the person also the person selling the used item has measurements, I'll look at those two, right? And then I'll kind of figure it out. Uh, with leather vintage leather jackets, you kind of just have the one person and that's it. So that kind of makes me more worried about it. That's not a great excuse, but that was a big reason. Another reason, I guess, would be, I guess there's three reasons. The second reason is that I just was in love with freewheelers too much. Um, and I just want, and along with that, just kind of liked the newness of breaking in the low jacket myself, especially when I was mostly buying new for a while, like kind of being the first to have the low jacket was kind of a cool experience. Um, but then the other biggest reason, the biggest reason why I still haven't gotten more into vintage leather jackets is like the condition slash provenance with them. Um, like if you have a freewheelers product from a freewheelers distributor, you know, it's a freewheelers product. Like you can be pretty confident it's a freewheelers product, you know, with the vintage leather jackets, even the guys that are into it will tell you like, yeah, maybe they, once they've had tons and tons of experience, like you can go talk to like, you know, if you know, cool other jackets on Instagram, right? yeah. like this dude has like gone through, I think he's even set himself like 200 jackets, like 200 leather jackets. He's got tons of vintage leather jackets. And, you know, if you get if you want to talk to somebody who knows more about leather jackets than me, go talk to him. Right. Um, and he's owned all of it. Like arrow freewheelers. He's got a freewheelers right now. He's got a bunch of field leathers, steady, like he's everything. Right. But even he will say like, he probably knows, he knows more than I do, but like, you're taking risks with this stuff. Um, and he's so into leather jackets. I just don't feel like I'm comfortable getting to his level of like getting that to that into it. And like, I've asked him, like, I will see like an eBay jacket that I think is good and I'll send it to him. Hey, is this good? And he'll be like, Oh no, for this reason and this reason and this reason. And I'm like, what? <laughs> like I was way off. Right. Like, the, and that's exactly why I did earlier. And that's kind of confirming it. Honestly, when I talk to the guys that really know their vintage leather jackets, it's like, like if you get a deal, then it doesn't really matter. Like, you know, I got one for free 
are there flaws with it? Yeah, but who cares? It was free. <laughs> but like, if I had spent a thousand dollars on it, would I be questioning that more? You know what I mean? Not, not that the guy was ever going to charge me that for it, but like, he just. Uh, if that was the situation like for example there's two leather jackets that i've been looking at for like a month right one of them was like oh i asked him is this a good deal and he's like no not really that's not a good deal like you can get that jacket for way cheaper i'm like yeah but when am i gonna find that jet the same jacket for cheaper right like when is that gonna happen and then there's another one where it's like oh this one looks good but it's a leather jacket and it's been in Thailand for a while and the humidity might have destroyed it without me even knowing it. And like, that's again, uh, you know, that kind of thing. Then if you want to get into like vintage Buko jackets, there's certain vintage Buko jackets that are better than other ones. Like if you talk to guys that know about vintage Buko jackets, this is another thing I didn't even realize this years ago, but this is exactly why I didn't get into vintage leather jackets. Turns out like the early ones are way better made than the ones that come after a certain, another certain point. It's such a nightmare. Like, you think, like, what we already do is, like, like nitpicky and crazy and difficult to follow and all that sort of stuff. Like, like I get annoyed when people equate Fountainhead with Freewheelers because Fountainhead is just nowhere near the level of Freewheelers. Yeah. Right? Like, obviously, Real McCoys and Freewheelers are close and, like, you know, Rainbow Country and, and stuff like that. And, like, Thetty is amazing, right? But, like, you know, some of these newer Japanese brands, I just can't, the patterns are so terrible. It's a joke. But that's nothing compared to like the vintage leather jacket world. And it's just, it's a lot. Um, I, I'm learning more and I'm starting to like look more into the vintage stuff. But there's just so much more risk with it. And it's such a deeper dive unless you like just have like the money and you just tell somebody like a finder, you just go to like the Ralph, the double RL stores. And they have like a perfect J24 for like five thousand dollars or whatever it is now, right? And you just buy it, right? And I just don't, I'm not going to do that, you know. So that's I don't know if that explains it's again very long answer for it, but there's a lot to the vintage leather jacket world, especially now when they're getting more and more sought after. That just it's a lot to get into, <laughs> and I I like to do it right, you know what I mean. Like when I buy stuff and I don't want to, I don't want to get taken. I don't want to mess it up basically, which I already have with other leather jackets. But the other thing is like, I've mostly come out, come out even with my leather jackets. I bought a lot of my free leather jackets used. I've sold a decent amount of them for more than I bought them for, um, or sold them for exactly what I bought them for. Um, so it's not actually that crazy. Um, but with vintage ones, if you realize something's wrong with it, is it morally right for you to sell it for the same you bought it for? If somebody was lying about that. Sort of so yeah, it's just so much. It's it's overwhelming for me at this point. So yeah, yeah I, f- I figured the answer would be something like that. But like, as someone who just barely even learned about vintage leather jackets, you know, um, I had yeah no idea about like half that stuff. I, yeah. I think I think to me, like the only reason for me in my ignorance was just that i assumed most of them would be like falling apart and disintegrating and stuff a lot of them are though that is the thing like a lot of them are if somebody if i could find like a perfect condition like j22 like i i've looked for those i spent months looking for like a perfect j22 i just haven't found it and i'll keep looking if i find one that's in a price range that i feel comfortable with then i would buy it but again it's another thing where it's like is it one of the good ones is it not one of the good ones is it actually in good condition or not like it's just it's so much. So, are you the kind of person that would possibly ever own some leather jackets that don't actually fit you, but they're just like a collector piece, kind of like David? Hill? No. Okay. No, I don't think I would ever do that. Like that's if if that were the case, I'd still have all my free wheelers jackets. You know. Oh, I hear you. Yeah. Yeah, like I want to wear and I want it to fit well on me. Like, like I, you know, when I first got into this type of stuff, I was all about like what's the highest quality item, right? And I still care about that a lot, but definitely more into how does this look on me. And I think part of that was like, again, when I, now that I've lost most of the weight that I wanted to lose and I, um, things just feel like they fit me better in general, honestly. Um, it, that kind of made me more aware of fit as well. So, um, I started to care a lot more about that. So I like, 
you know, I actually bought a Vanson for two hundred fifty dollars. Stitching on it is garbage. It's absolute garbage. But I'm not selling it because it fits really great on me, and it's beat to heck, and it's super comfortable, and it looks like it looks like a, a '60s vintage jacket or a '50s vintage jacket. And it's really only from like the '90s, you know, because it's that beat up, and it's you know, it's a perfecto style jacket. So it just it could most people. The back is not. The back is the only thing I don't like. It's really squeaky. Those are the only things I actually don't like about like the crappy stitching. I don't care about <laughs> because I didn't pay the price for it. And like same thing with the sixties cow. There's a lot of like broken stitches and mistakes and poor stitching on it. it. It fits so well and I didn't pay anything for it. So who cares? You know? So that's the kind of stuff that I'm realizing. Like the jacket that I have on order is actually that's coming that I have coming in is a, a real McCoy's jacket not a freewheelers because the measurements look like this jacket's going to fit me like a million bucks. Even though every freewheelers jacket I've had is better made than every McCoy's jacket I've had, but it's, it should fit me like a million bucks. So that's, you know, where I'm at now. <laughs> nice. So definitely would not have like collector's stuff. The only thing that I have that's like a collector's two collector's pieces that I have are the pair of RJB jeans that I had that are way too big yet too skinny for me, like too skinny in the legs, but too wide in the waist. And the pair that I had, um, the original like founder and owner and designer of uh, Blyhead and RJB sign. So I had like a collab pair of Real Japan Blues jeans that he signed for me. Those will never get sold. That's it. That's cool. So when you get something, you want to wear it and use it. Yeah. Have it be part of your life. Yeah, that's really cool. It's really cool. Yeah, I, I wear this stuff like everywhere to work. If I'm outside, this is what I'm wearing. Nice. I want to wear it a lot. Yeah. I'm the same, actually. And not everyone is, and that's okay, but yeah. I'm the same. So I resonate with you in, uh, in that regard, for sure. Um, yeah, I see you guys on your vacation and stuff, and you got your same clothes on. That's <laughs> very cool. So let's transition to some of the things that at least on the forums and stuff that I'm on, I don't see you get to talk about as much, which would be like your hats. I'd love to hear about your hat journey and everything you think about hats and why you wear the hats you wear and stuff and your, the makers you like. And then also some of the accessories that you have, you know, your glasses and your belts and stuff like that, which, you know, people normally don't notice that stuff because it's like the details, right? But that's why we love it, right? We love the details. So Yes, yeah, so maybe maybe start with the hats if you want, but like, yeah, yeah. what what makes you tick as uh, no, as the hat, hat love, game goes? Yeah, I love this because yeah, we don't talk about it enough. It's what I said before is like a lot of people wear all this great stuff and then they have a terrible hat or whatever. <laughs> it just like kind of bugs me, you know. Um, like I, I like that the effort that you want to wear a hat. Hats are awesome, but like, please get a slightly better one, thank you. Um, again, it doesn't <laughs> have to be the best thing, just not a garbage one. So one thing, if you're watching this, don't buy a wool hat. I know it's funny, like wool is amazing, like in terms of it's like water, like resistance and it's like all that sort of like not water resistance, but like it's it's good with water, like if it's an outerwear garment, but not if it's a hat, actually. Um, like a tweed flat cap is fine, but like if you're like a felt, wool felt is trash. It's terrible. Like it it gets basically ruined by water. It doesn't handle water well, and it's essentially like it feels like it's like styrofoam. If you bend it, it might snap. Whereas like this is a beaver fur felt hat, 100% beaver fur, you can do whatever you want to it, and it'll just like. But you can actually move it. It's not like, like I felt wool hats where like either they're too bendy and they'll just completely collapse, or they're like hard like a rock and you can't move it. So, um, but yeah, hats started because uh, how I got into this style of clothing in general, westerns. I grew up loving western films. I loved old western movies. Um, and I even took a, a class in college on just Western films. Best class ever. <laughs> that sounds awesome. Yeah, it was awesome. That same semester, I took a class on playwriting, which was actually super fun, too. It's really, really good semester of classes. Um, and so I did own like an actual cowboy hat for a while. I've had it modified into something else. But yeah, what I go for now is I love like fedoras, but like actual fedoras, not like the unfortunate negative meme that fedoras have become which every time like you see like the tips fedora thing or whatever like you know angry video game nerds wearing fedoras 
those are not fedoras, those are trilbies with the really tiny little brims. Um, so yeah, first high quality hat I got was from like a uh, buckaroo hatters. It's a good like Western, most of you make Western hats in Tennessee. I've had that one since modified by Cody Wellema to like more of a fedora style. It's like the one with it's the black one with like the black and burgundy band. I love that hat. Yeah. Yeah. So that one was, it didn't used to look like that. It actually was originally supposed to be a replica of the hat that Ben Foster wore in 310 to Yuma. Oh, because right I will on. still say, even though he mixed black and brown, Ben Foster's character, Charlie Prince in 310 to Yuma, favorite Western character of all time. Nice. Brilliant portrayal. If you've never seen 310 to Yuma, watch that. And just Charlie Prince's double breasted white button leather jacket is the coolest thing ever. Um, so yeah, Western films. Um, so like this is a fedora, but it's kind of like slightly more Western esque. It's kind of like a high, I would almost call it like a hybrid sort of thing. It's like a two and three quarter, two and seven eighth inch brim, I think. Pretty low profile. So it's like it's fedora, but it's not it's kind of in the middle ish. That's kind of what I do, what I like. And then the first like hat that I wore a lot with this was from Tatten Baird. And it was like a like a Stetson Open Road style, basically like the first one you got too, same kind of style. I've had that one modified as well um, because I kind of didn't really end up liking the Cattleman crown. Great hat, like Tanberry did a great job. It's just, I my style changed, so like now it's more like a kind of like a teardrop shape, and that's kind of what I generally go for. So yeah, Beaver for hats. Um, there's actually a lot of good hat makers, interestingly, um, more than you would think. But you want to go with like the actual like good hat makers. Don't go with like again like uh, Goran Brothers or the other one's the Japanese one that everybody seems to wear stuff from. I can't remember the name. I wish I could catch it because it's important to like avoid stuff like that. You just don't want to buy a wool hat. At least 100% rabbit fur. That's a big piece of advice. Uh, beaver rabbit blends are good. But I would go for 100% beaver if you can. You don't have to though. Rabbit fur is still good, or hair. That like H A R E. Like that's good too. Um, uh, Wellama. I love Cody Wellama. Like uh, Allie, my wife's hat is from Wellama. Uh, this one's from Wellama. We actually bought these together. So like I bought this. Like when I got this one, she got hers. We got them together. Um, and so we went to a shop, and he's in Altadena, like in California. So. He's close enough by that we can we could go in person and pick everything out and like pick like the two different ribbons like one of these like is like a vintage Japanese ribbon I think from like the sixties or something or fifties or I don't forget but yeah like he does these like cool like double ribbon things that most people don't do um, Optimo is pretty good but they're now like very very expensive um, but they're still good uh, Tatten Baird makes some really good like Western style ones. Um, there's also uh, one of the ones I have is from Art Fawcett, uh, Vintage Silhouettes, who was like the biggest like known guy on the Fedora Lounge, but he retired. I got myself and my dad hats from him like within like two weeks before he stopped taking orders. Whoa. So we got like two of his last hats that he ever made. Um, so that's the dark brown one that I have, the, the, the really really dark brown one. That one's from him. Um. And so you can't get from him anyway. The, the guy who replaced him is actually really good though too. So you've been to Silhouettes, like a good bargain hat. Um, there's a bunch more though. That's the thing. There's actually quite a lot. It's like Penman hats apparently is really good. Um, who else? There's uh, Bowman Hat Company. He's the guy that I had modify my uh, my silver belly hat. He did a really good job. He makes his own hats, mostly Western style. He's in he's in uh, Cal Southern California. You got um, there's a couple there's like a few up in like Portland like Oregon areas a lot of Pacific Northwest ones um, Gannon Hat Company is one of the ones I'm thinking of so there's a lot actually so and a lot of them are really good I, there's 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 options there's a, quite a few good hat makers out there what you want is the ones that are making good traditional like hats, whether it's more of a, and they kind of all specialize in different styles. Some of them are more pure fedora, some will be more pure Western. Some will kind of do more of a hybrid style, which is kind of cool. And I tend to try to buy like what they specialize in. You just don't want to be getting the ones that like try to stick a match in it and then like burn the hats, like in like, don't, don't get into that stuff. 
don't go for, don't wear a hat that's i mean i guess you can't you know do what you want but like don't get a hat and then it turns out it's like a pork pie hat and you're wearing a pork pie with like suspenders and like your vintage like overalls like just don't like get like a top hat that like those guys that don't know what kind of hat they're making like there's a lot of stuff like that right now hats have gotten kind of trendy in some ways you know there's enough really good hat makers that just make like a good hat <laughs> that you don't have to mess with that stuff and there's some places around the world too like if you're not from this area like i know there's some a couple in europe not too many but there's a couple and most there's a lot in america though you've got your options so yeah like i kind of go more like a traditional like i guess i forget it's like more of a teardrop kind of style i think um and then fairly low flange for the most part um and then uh for accessories but oh i also have some caps too like i have a couple from that i like uh baseball cast from troy o'shea he does a great job and a couple from ebbets which are pretty good too but troy o'shea is definitely like a step above um and then i've got caps from uh, monsivace which are pretty cool and then from the well-dressed head who's like feels like the rolls royce of of like black caps and like vintage like 1910s so 1930s like caps mostly those are for summer because i don't like straw hats there's so many dudes that like old you know, fat dads in um, flat in, in in straw hats with Hawaiian shirts and shorts and sandals in Southern California. There's just so much of that that I just don't think I could ever wear a straw hat like a straw fedora, no matter how good it is. I just I just can't do it. So I if I want like a summery hat, like I have the ones from Well Dressed Head that are like straw or linen or stuff like that. That's what I would wear. Um, so for accessories. I had a really nice watch at one point. I do not anymore. I sold it to buy a free wheelers jacket. Um, if I had all the money in the world, I would have an uh, like an along zona a perpetual calendar. Um, like I know about watches, not to a huge degree, but like I know some stuff. Um, I'd love a Grand Seiko. I would love uh, an IWC perpetual calendar. <laughs> there's <laughs> there's some stuff that I'd really like to have, but it's. Uh, you know, uh, I would have to save up for years and years and years and not buy any of this stuff in order to get something that I would really want. Um, so, yes, I could buy a cheaper watch, too. I don't know. I just, I don't know if I'm a snob with watches, even though I don't own one, that, like, I would just really want, like, one of the really, really, really nice ones. <laughs> but, yeah, I don't have watches. And I used to wear a bunch of stuff on my wrist. Honestly, part of it, I like my wrist to be able to move around. I don't find watches comfortable i do like wearing rings though so both of these are from the flathead actually so when my brother and i went on our first trip to japan and i got to go to the flathead facility and all this stuff and we went to the store to like buy some stuff i actually like the rings the best so this is really cool rgb this is my oh besides my wedding ring this is my favorite ring um like my favorite accessory i've ever owned yeah that's and awesome this rgb ring I was a massive RJB fan. Still do love their stuff. I still have a bunch of shirts from them. Best shirt fabrics ever, Flathead and RGB. No one has ever come along to touch them. I also just love the logo. I think the RJB pirate logo thing is just the coolest thing. And the fact that this like ring displayed that pirate logo is just so cool. Um, so I got this. And then this one is like, because it's amethyst, it's purple, it's my favorite color. So I got this one too. And so these are the two things that I was wearing for a long time. And now I have my wedding ring, obviously. And I made sure to get a wedding ring that, uh, you know, Allie and I went to like kind of check them out and stuff like that. And obviously at like the regular jewelry stores, they just had, I don't know, stuff I didn't like. So this is from, uh, I actually forget where, but I got this at like the same kind of store that like I buy like this stuff from is chunkier. So it kind of fits. That's awesome. That's a super cool ring, man. Yeah. So that's it for like, and um, I used to wear way too much accessories. I've written a whole article on my website about how I look like an idiot wearing way too many accessories. Um, the secret for me was I wore too, way too many accessories because I wanted to look cool and I didn't feel like I looked cool. And then I lost weight and I'm like, okay, I look good enough that I don't need all these accessories. <laughs> that was my experience with that. It's like, oh, I, I have self-confidence now. Um, I don't need to wear these accessories anymore. So I stopped wearing them. So, um, but what I do have is like, I have a, a 
my key holder is from the flathead still have it uh, i've had it for years um wallets are mostly from wild frontier goods i think he makes amazing wallets like ali's wallets are from him my wallets are from him um just he's such a he's such a great leather nerd like picking out the coolest stuff um awesome dude too uh, i got to meet him in japan so love his stuff for wallets um and that's basically it aside from glasses now i am a big glasses nerd um and sunglasses nerd so the if you notice like every time i'm wearing glasses it's always the same style it's always the late 40s style club masters or brow line glasses is what what they're actually called so i've you know gonna do my research on this everybody always says they're 50s style they're actually not technically they're invented i think it was 1947 um and it wasn't by ray-ban ray-ban did not invent this style um i actually forget the name of the brand that invented them but they're still around um and it's called the brow line glasses where basically it's acetate here here except for in the middle and here at the bottom where it's metal so this is the style i always wear for glasses the first pair i got like that was my globe specs um the reggie i think is what's called and i think there's still some not in the same color i have it's like actually a navy color i think self edge still sells them um and they're fantastic and i still have them i still use them and then more recently i finally because i needed to go back and forth from work because I need them at work, I need them at home. I needed a couple other pairs to just have. And so I have some from Jacques Marie Maj now, which my buddy John B. Brooklyn got me into. Uh, he has the largest collection in the world of Jacques Marie Maj. Um, I don't have anywhere near that, but um, I just love the brown line style on me. That's what I think suits my face well. So for eyeglasses, that's what I have. So I have two pairs of Jacques Marie Maj. These one I'm wearing right now, this is my favorite one of my favorite things I own are these glasses. I think they're stunning. Um, they're actually, I don't know if you can see them, but they're actually a super, super dark green. Um, and then it's, everything else is gold. Wow. I, yeah, I always thought they were black. So that's really yeah. cool that they're dark green. So it's actually like a super dark green, which you can see in some pictures that I have in some angles. And just, I don't know, these are just like, can't go over how gorgeous these are um so i love these um and then i have like a matte brown pair i think they're pretty cool too and then so for sunglasses i love sunglasses <laughs> i've actually said like if i had to pick between leather jackets and sunglasses i'd pick sunglasses and i don't think a lot of people know that like that's how much i love and need sunglasses like i will wear them inside of stores a lot because of I, how much i don't like the bright lights and stuff like that um so mostly what i've worn for the longest time with sunglasses was square like uh like military or aviator style ones kind of like offshoots of like the american optical like pilot glasses um if you know what i'm talking about with those um basically any american movie where there are pilots that's the style of glasses they're wearing every time they were um i they were wearing those in because i remember seeing it was a really terrible marvel movie Brie Larson. What's the one Brie Larson was in? Yeah. Uh, Captain, Captain Marvel. Marvel. Yeah. Captain Marvel. So in Captain Marvel, they're pilots and they were wearing the, that style of glasses. Um, so uh, the ones that I've had the longest are from Oliver Peoples. Um, wouldn't recommend them really anymore. I have some like older pairs that I got that were like the main Japan ones because they're owned by like Luxottica. But the main Japan stuff is still not still good because it's still made in Japan. So I have those. Um, the victor, the one I like the most is the Victory. It's like the ones that are like the dark, dark, dark brown lens that I have. They were from a TV show. I think Burn Notice. The guy wore them. Different lens frame, lens color, but I love those. Um, and then I have some from Globe Specs, and then I have some from. So that's actually what I. And then I have like an aviator style from uh, the Benedict from Oliver Peoples, and now I have some. Jacques Marie Maj acetate ones that I really like. And then I have more recent. And then I also have some uh, Matsuda ones that are aviators. So I've got quite a few. Basically, you want to keep it independent. I would generally suggest made in Japan. But I mean, like, there's some other great glasses brands out there that make stuff in other places. Like, if you get some independent Italian ones or like independent uh, other ones that are really good, like uh, my buddy Big June and Denim just got a new pair of eyeglasses from Cutler and Gross that just look awesome. Those are really cool too. Like, I, I 
Jacques Mimage is great, but I still also like have like Matsuda and other stuff. Like I think Matsuda, if you want like metal, I don't think anybody does as much like detail with metal glasses as Matsuda does, for example. If you want acetate, I've never experienced acetate as nice as Jacques Mimage's acetate. So that's kind of what I would say. But like I'm not saying everybody ha- like I love glasses. I have a lot. Um a lot of people always think I have people always think I have more leather jackets and boots than I have. I've got four leather jackets right now, and two of them I pay like it's I, my leather jacket collection right now is very low in price relatively at this point, you know. Um, and I don't actually have that many boots anymore. I just sold a ton. Like I have a lot of other stuff too. Cause, like I care about that stuff, and which is why you asked me about it. I guess so. Thanks. <laughs> do you do you even need to wear glasses? <laughs> No, I have. I think we we DM'd about this briefly one time. I've always wanted glasses, which is funny because yes, mo- most people that have them don't want th- to have them. And you were like, "No, I actually love my glasses." You know? So, yeah, I'm happy I have them. I I wanted them before I needed them. Oh, that's crazy! Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, like, obviously, I like my eyesight being great, uh, but if it ever gets a little bit poorer, like most people would be like, "Oh man," and I'll be like. You know, skipping over to the optometrist. <laughs> That's exactly what I did. <laughs> I'm not kidding. That's exactly what I did because I just like, I don't know, I like the structure that glasses give my face. Personally, I think I look better with glasses on. That's my opinion. Um, so when I needed glasses, I was kind of happy. Like I went, like, because I could feel like, my eyes were getting slightly after like being on the computer for a while. So when I first got a pair, like I really only needed like a, a very light prescription, but I was still happy. It's like, no, I'm going to get them. Now I actually need a heavier prescription. So I could, I need them all the time now, pretty much like not all the time, all the time, but like if I'm on the computer at all, if I'm driving at night, like I, I do need them a lot more now. Um, so yeah, I was actually, I don't mind at all. I mean, they get dirty, but that's it. Like, otherwise I'm perfectly happy having glasses it's, it's kind of funny well I, I think you look good without them but i think for me it's like while you don't want as you said on that one article about accessories you don't want to look like a christmas tree with like too many accessories on the other hand i think it's the accessories that bring dimension to your style right like that's why in movies like key characters they always have some kind of special set of accessories like that's mm-hmm. how you define who they are they don't just walk in with like just like a t-shirt and sweatpants like it's it's the glasses or the earrings or the necklace or the crazy hair or the guitar or whatever you know and so like i think that's why i'm always kind of like in a good way jealous of people that have glasses because like i see your style and i'm like dude like there's this dimension that i don't really get to play with because he has glasses and i don't ah no, you know? it, it is a thing and you know once so since my wife and i got married we've been watching a ton of reality tv together and i've been loving every second of it um and Two, two of the shows that we've been watching the most that are Ink Master and uh, Master Chef. <laughs> nice. We love Gordon Ramsay. We're both huge Gordon Ramsay fans. Um, so, and it's a thing like you glasses really can be a huge signature thing. So, um, one of the if you watch older Master Chef episodes, one of the, sh- the hosts who used to be on it, Graham Elliott, um, he's a chef and he always wears white glasses. And they won't always be the exact same pair, but he always has white glasses. And it's a really cool signature thing. Um, and there was another guy that was on Master, Sh- not Master, sorry, on Ink Master. And he was a contestant. And then he kind of came back a few times. And every time he always had the same pair of glasses on. And it was a very unique pair, very big, very blocky looking, with like a little bit of metal here. I want to say they look like they were made by Dita or Dita. I don't know if they were, but they just had the, the Dita or Dita style. Um, and they looked like a million bucks on him. And you just knew every time like that was him. And there's a really cool signature piece that he had. Um, so, yeah, like I totally, that's why I kind of always wanted them. And that's why, at least for eyeglasses, part of the reason why I always just wear brow lines is like, it's kind of like, like we said, like I don't need to look like a Christmas tree anymore, but that's my signature thing is I either have sunglasses on or I have my brown line glasses on. Like that's a that's a thing for me. Like is it's I don't need to be like all Christmas treat up, but my I, like my sunglasses or eyeglasses are like a 
a thing for me. That's how I'm recognized, but I don't need all the other stuff anymore. So I guess let's talk about the hats again, because it seems like most of your accessories, they're kind of always the same, or at least in the same category, whereas the hats are the ones that you change styles drastically. You have like, you know, a low cattleman's crease and a teardrop the next day and a flat cap the next day. Um, how do you go about choosing that for your fit? Like, I think for a lot of people, everything from the neck down is very intuitive, or at least they know what they want. Mm -hmm. Then when it comes to adding a hat into it, they're like, I don't know which hat to put on. You know, so how do you choose that on the day to day as far as like color and style and all that? So for the style of hats, they are more similar now, to be honest. Like I said, I don't have the cattleman is not a cattleman anymore. I had it. I had it reshaped. Oh, OK. So that's one of the things is I did have it reshaped um, and not because I didn't like having variety is more like I realized I like the way more like a traditional like pinch kind of looks on me. Um, the cattleman, I have a fairly wide face. Um, so I like having a little bit of a point here. I just feel like that looks better on me. Um, so yes, there are different like brim widths and, but most of my hats, I even the, the Optimo that I had, which is like that kind of light gold, like, well, like not light, but like that kind of greenish gold one that I have. Um, that one had a slightly different crease. I actually just recreased it myself. It's such a nice felt that I can actually recrease it, change the crease completely without even steam. That's how nice of a felt that is. It's, it's all beaver belly. It's 100% beaver belly, like silver belly. It's dyed silver belly, so it's super soft. Um, so I recreased it to more of this style also. <laughs> so like all my hats basically have like the same style of crown now. Um, so now it's really basically just color and different bands, essentially, at this point. Um, and so for that, it's basically, so it's very simple now for me, honestly, and it's just color. That's really it. And um the silver belly goes with almost everything except for really light golden colors. Cause it's kind of cold, like silver belly is kind of cold. Um, like you don't really, you don't wear tan with gray, right? That's like one of the few color combos you don't really do too often. Right. Um, so I don't do that, but anything else the silver belly goes with, it'll go with everything. Um, and then I have a black hat for when I wear black stuff. And then I have the brown ones for when i wear brown stuff and i can kind of there's certain things that i think look better in certain situations but really i can do almost any of the brown ones with almost any of my brown stuff it, it's not like something i really think out exactly it's like i look and it's like okay that works that works you know yeah. um so it's pretty simple now um for the which kind of hats i choose at this point uh, for the most part, like obviously I just kind of do my hair a lot of the time too. Like I like my hair as well. So I just kind of go back and forth between the two. I kind of go through phases as well sometimes where I'll like just kind of get it. Once I get a haircut, I'll do that. I'll have my hair all nice for a month with my kind of like faux pompadour thing. And then the next month I'll just do hats. It's kind of a thing. That's kind of how I do a lot. Okay. Um, and then, um, I also for the when I wear the caps now at this point, when it gets hotter, at this point it's that's kind of more when I bring those out because most of my caps at this point are lightweight and breathable, um, and specifically for warmer weather because like I said I don't want to have a straw hat. Not that you can't do it, but again it just gives me old man Tommy Bahama vibes. Dude, I totally get that. <laughs> and that's just like, and there's so like I'll give you an example. Not to be mean to my dad, but. My dad only wears straw hats <laughs> and he's in Southern, he's a, you know, he's a dad in Southern California and he wears straw hats and it's just like, nah, not for me. So, well, cause, cause that's what Walmart sells, you know? So <laughs> yeah. that's the thing in Southern California, it's fairly warm here. So everybody wears straw hats. If you have a hat, it's straw hat. Um, there's very few people wearing fur felt hats. So, and I will try to wear these into very warm weather because I just refuse to wear a straw hat. But when it gets too hot, I will wear the caps because I have like I have a couple caps that are um, that are not even leather bands. They're actually fat. They're like whatever fabric the hat's made out of. The band's made out of that too, so it's ah. very breathable and very nice for summer. So that's how I determine that. Nice. Well, thanks for that look into your accessories because I mean I don't know if it's a big deal to everybody else, but I love it. So I'm glad that we could you yeah. Know, converse about I think that. it's super important. Yeah. Like. It, even when I style my hair, like if I ever do like a video with somebody, if you notice that like anytime I do a video interview or I talk to anybody from ever on somebody's channel, I always put a hat on. 
always nice it's just like a thing the That's glasses cool. I actually need because i'm looking at a screen so those are going to be on the like those have to be on but like the hat is conscious somebody asked me one time on one of my videos like you know these comments people leave um they're like why the heck do you have a leather jacket and a hat on indoors and i was like because it's youtube bro <laughs> exactly i used to get those comments too i'm like dude it's youtube are you kidding me right now and like i, I had this style epiphany one day so i went up to when i was still an electrician i went up to oakland for this electrical conference thing we were supposed to go to and i just remember like because I'm, I'm in a more like rural area um mm -hmm. in the south bay and i just remember looking around and the the, the range of style up in like San Francisco, Oakland, places like that. And probably where you live, it's just like so broad. I mean, people wear crazy stuff. Like, it's like, whoa. And I just thought to myself, like, dude, people can wear like whatever they want. So if they're going to wear like all this insane stuff, like then I can wear whatever I want, you know? Yeah. Um, and then you've talked a lot about that on your podcast and stuff, but yeah, that was kind of a freeing moment. So yeah, <laughs> do a YouTube video. It's like, I'm going to wear a grizzly jacket, even though it's like 80 degrees outside because <laughs> I'm in an air conditioned building and I'm yep. shooting a video and it's fun. So that's what we're going to do. What, what no, that's what the good news about me for work is like, I'm it's air conditioned and I get there really early in the morning. So I basically get to wear a leather jacket all day, almost the entire year. It's kind of awesome. There's some days where it's too warm, but like other than that, like most, I get to wear my leather jackets a lot. That's so cool. Because of that. So do you feel like the Bodhi with its deer skin or goat skin? Deer skin. Okay, deer skin. Do you do you feel like that lends itself to your particular climate a little more? Like, is it not as hot to wear that versus horse hide, or is it kind of all the same? Pretty much the same. Um, the 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 coolest jacket I've ever owned is the Mister Freedom uh, um, uh, Campus Stallion jacket. Because that one was a fairly a slightly thinner cowhide and it was unlined. So that one I could actually push into slightly warmer weather. Otherwise, they're pretty much all the same. It's kind of funny. Like people say, like, oh, you should have like cotton liner versus a, a flannel liner. Those don't make that much of a difference, honestly. Um, like, a silk liner. I used to have a, a red silk A2 from Real McCoy's. That one I could push into slightly warmer weather because it was silk. And if you've ever felt like silk or rayon, like especially silk though, like it feels like wet and kind of cold. So you could kind of push that into slightly warmer weather. Um, but no, the deer skin is, it's just stupidly comfortable. Like I used to always say like, like you wear leather jackets because they're cool and you're sacrificing comfort for them. And then I got my deerskin jacket. So I was like, oh, I can have my cake and eat it too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So that was, and then also actually with the vintage jackets, like the, the vintage cow, that thing's actually stupid comfortable too. It's a pretty heavy like cow hide, but it's so old and so broken in that like, it's not as comfortable as a deerskin, but it's close. So it's really nice to just throw that on too. It's kind of interesting. Like now I see why people complain about like the heavy Chrome Excel jackets and the stiffness of Shinky sometimes. Like I get it now. Like, oh, there are actually comfortable leather jackets. Yeah, I was really thrown off because I went up to Standard and Strange like nine, ten months ago and they had some Simmons built jackets that were in goat skin. And yeah, it's just totally different. Yeah, it's like leather, but it feels like cloth almost. It's just so flexible. And yeah, I, I almost didn't know what to do with it because it was just a different category entirely, you know? Mm -hmm. You know, different leathers make a huge difference. Like if you, and if you try something like sheepskin or cape skin, like it, you know, it's all very different. Lambskin, like leather jackets are a wider variety than I think people realize. And even wider than I used to realize too. Nice. So let's shift gears a bit. And I wanted to ask you, what is maybe like, what are, got to get English correct. What are three pieces of advice 
for people when it comes to photography or like posting on Instagram? Because I know like you care about all these details and you also care about the photography. You know, you try to do a good job with everything you're doing. So like if you're going to give advice to people posting, like what, what, what would it be? Well, um, it doesn't matter anymore because Instagram hates everybody. It uh, hates all of us now. So yeah. that's one thing that's kind of obvious. Um, but yeah, no, I do care about it. I'm not saying I'm perfect at it, but it is, that's another one, another one of the fun things is like getting more into photography as a result of this. Um, first thing is understand the lighting. Um, like unless you have a flash, don't backlight yourself. It makes things a lot more difficult. Um, so like what you got to do is try to find the most shade you can if it's bright out or try to take your stuff early in the morning or, you know, in golden hour in the right spot, like you'll figure it out. But like, you'll kind of see like if you're facing this direction, you take a picture, then try facing this. And then, you know, you kind of will figure that out that like, you'll see where you look the best. Um, and you want to make sure like, obviously like, you're at the very least your entire outfit is covered in shade or you know keep it consistent um and if you can try to get your background shaded too rather than like super bright in the background with you shaded i have to compromise on that often obviously um lightroom actually has this really cool new tool uh, i don't know how new it is but like uh you can actually uh, like separate the subject from the background and edit accordingly so i can actually if my background's super bright i can actually wake make it a lot less bright that helps um obviously having a flash will solve that. that's why standard and strange's pictures always come out so great if you don't know that like standard and strange like all the pictures neil takes he pretty much is always using a flash um if you're a real photographer he, he, this is the there's always this phrase um and it's totally true even though i don't use flash but it's i, I believe it you can always tell i've had photographers tell me this you can always tell the difference between professional photographers and amateur photographers at a photography convention because the amateurs go straight to the cameras and the lenses and the professionals go straight to the lighting. Your camera doesn't matter anywhere near as much as your lighting setup does. Um, so like for our wedding photographer, for example, I made sure like when I was interviewing them, I asked them what, fly, like what gear they used. I didn't really care what camera they used. I cared, he, and then when he told me he used, had multiple flashes and multiple flash setups and soft boxes, I was like, yep, okay, cool. You know lighting, that's, then you're the person I want. And our pictures came out amazing because he used flash on every single one of them pretty much. Like he did in different flashes for different, so that's what matters. Um, you know, I don't do that because for what we do, like we're also having fun with it and adding flash to it for everything is a huge amount of work. Like it's a, way more stuff to bring way more stuff to worry about and the whole other thing to learn and we kind of like to have fun with it um but i've always gone back and forth about getting flash but so yeah lighting is the first thing second thing is learning how to edit your pictures um using like a lightroom or um there's other programs Lightroom is what i use but like there's other programs for that um so you do you can do a lot in post um uh, and along with that shoot in raw i think that's better than shooting JPEG, like that does help if you want to make your pictures actually look really nice. Um, there's a lot of other guys that do really good photography. Not, you know, I'm not even the best, like uh, a urban composition. That guy does really good photos. He's a really good photographer. Um, Lucas Z Fitz, if you just for like, like lifestyle and like, like street almost kind of photography, he is really good. I think uh, Big Dude and Denim, who's also a really good photographer, he was like, I think I saw him, him comment or we talked about it. He's like, when did Lucas get so good at photography? And I looked at it and like, <laughs> was like, Lucas like got his little Fuji and just got really good at photography. Like, so that's another guy. Like, um, he doesn't, he puts tons of effort into like his, like, if you go on his stories, like his like weekends, like, that dude is really good at that kind of stuff. Really cool, like little moody like shots of like these little old buildings. He's in Massachusetts, man. He's very inspirational stuff. Um, Neil from Santa Strange. Just go look at Santa Strange's pictures. Like they always look really good, you know. But he's more like a like a standard setup for like product photography. Like, uh, and that gives me my third advice, which is um, know what kind of lenses and cameras you're using. Like, I uh, yeah, you can make just a phone work 
And if that's all you want to do, you can make that work. But I do think it it doesn't just make your pictures look better when you use an actual camera, but I think it's inspiring for you as a person. Like I've talked to that about that with people. Like it's more than just snapping a picture of your outfit with your phone. Then there's more to think about. And it's also yes, it makes it more work, but it also makes it a lot more fun. Um, and so having like photography become part of it, you will get more into it and think about it more when you have a camera versus when you have a phone. Because the phones always are it's you can tell the difference. I you know people say, Oh, it doesn't matter. Maybe depending on what you're doing, like if you're Albert um upstate guy style like his his feet is half the caption his caption is half of his feet anyway right it's not just the pictures so him getting a camera wouldn't make that much of a difference i guess although i do notice when neil takes his pictures versus when he takes his own picture or when carl has taken his pictures versus when he's taken his own pictures like you can tell the difference you can always tell the difference um but yeah know like what kind of camera you're using and like the lenses that matters um like you want to have something like fairly telephoto um, to make it more flattering. Uh, the pictures that Allie and I, like uh, Vintage Feather, my wife, in my pictures, most of what we post are taken with uh, a 135 millimeter f1.8 lens, which is fairly telephoto. Um, now, obviously, you can go to like 600 and more, but like that's on the pretty far end for like a portrait lens. Most people will take stuff with like either a 35 at this to, in today's day and age a lot of people take them with 35s 50s and 85s um i have a 35 and 85 and a 135 and if i can i take everything with a 135 just more compression and it's just more flattering brings the background forward it cuts out more of the extraneous background stuff and then it just makes you look more like how you actually look it's more flattering on the person so yeah that's the other thing um but yeah also in just in general, yeah get get a camera if you can it doesn't have to be expensive it doesn't have to be a great one, but you'll be more inspired and learn more stuff about photography and take, you know, I just think you get more motivated to take better pictures if you have a camera versus if you're just using your phone. Yeah, totally. Yeah, this has been something I've been wanting to get into because uh, I had this big kick with photography in high school, borrowed my dad's old Minolta, like film camera. Awesome. And then, and then it finally broke, but that was fun. And then we went to Africa like in 2007 or something. And uh, I got a Canon Rebel. And then later on in our marriage, we got a new Canon Rebel. So we have an SLR and I, I'm not like great at it, but I, I know like roughly how to use it and stuff. I've got like a, a fixed 50, you know, the standard like 75 to 300 that they give you in the like mm -hmm. combo pack, you know, and then like another like 15 to 85 or whatever it is so nothing fantastic but uh definitely have been wanting to get back into it right now i just use my phone because i think like a lot of people it's just what's convenient you know and it yeah. like totally bugs me how my photos turn out but it's like it it works um but anyways yeah so i appreciate the advice for for me and other people who are like looking to maybe take it to the next level at some point yeah, just get, you don't need anything super fancy. What I would, if you're not wanting to spend a lot of money, best advice I have for everybody is just get a Fuji, get a Fuji film. Um, if you don't, if you don't already have something, right? Uh, I would suggest uh, like a Fuji X-T20 or Fuji X-T30. They're not that expensive. They're like standard 35 millimeter lens to be like a 50 millimeter equivalent is like 300 bucks. You get the whole setup for probably 700 dollars it's not i mean it's less than a phone you can get the whole setup for less than a phone and you will take better pictures than any phone cam no, doesn't matter what the phone says it has here's the thing like the phones no matter how they're get, they keep getting better sure but like the sensor will never be as big as an actual like decent camera like yes the fuji films are aps-c which is smaller than a full frame 35 millimeter equivalent but it's still way bigger than a phone than a phone sensor will be way bigger so you're going to be taking better pictures um and you have to think about more with those um the fujis are really cool as a learning setup because a lot of the fujis everything is on is mechanically you can actually adjust everything mechanically so so you can adjust the exposure compensation manually you can adjust the aperture manually on the lens almost all their all their good lenses have the aperture control um you can adjust your um ISO manually, and you can adjust uh, 
the shutter speed manually on most of their cameras. Not all of them, but like most of them, you know, like the XT series, even the cheaper XT ones, you can do that manually. And so it's a really, like I learned on a Fujifilm and I am so glad I learned on a Fujifilm. Um, now I have a, a nicer setup and I can tell the difference, but like, that's a great learning thing and you can get that set up for really cheap and it'd still be really good. That's awesome. Yeah, I mean, I think me included, the reason a lot of people, even though like maybe technically a really good person could take the same photo almost on like an SLR versus an iPhone, the reason they just continue not to take good photos is because it's always auto. Like, like the phone does it all. Like I know like technically you could get a good image, but it's like, like anything in life if you're not understanding all the nuts and bolts of like, okay, why was it overexposed? Or like, why is the zoom wrong? Why is the depth of field or the perspective yep. all wrong? Like you have no idea why it's doing that. It's just like, Oh, I guess I need to like take the photo from a different angle with my auto phone, you know? And I know a lot of them now the phones, you can adjust settings and stuff, but you're never really learning that way. And so that's, no, I think why I'm inspired to at some point kind of start. I mean, you can it. use what you have, just put the 50 on. It's basically for, it's like basically an 85, which is a standard portrait lens essentially. And that's what I started with even before, before I got my Fuji to make sure I wanted the Fuji, I just kept borrowing my mom's Canon, like an 80 D and like it was the nifty 50. And I just borrowed that, and, you know, I let, I kind of borrow this kind of borrow this whenever I needed it. And I was just like using, okay, I'm having fun with this. I kind of started to figure this out. Okay, I'm going to get my camera, right? So that's what I did. Nice. So yeah, I mean, you can start off with that. It's still something, it'll still, you'll still take better pictures with that than with the phone. Nice. Like you will look better, even, let's say even like it's an old, I don't know how old your Canon is, but let's say it's so old that your phone sensor is almost better. The pictures will still look better because of the lens on it and like the, I forget exactly, I can't explain exactly the science, but like your proportions and your body will look more flattered with the camera with that lens on it than it will with the phone. Yeah, no, totally. <laughs> yeah, totally. Well, and then phones make people do weird things too. Yeah. Like you're never going to like set your SLR camera precariously on a rock on the ground next to a river, right? Yeah. Like you're going to take care of the thing. Whereas like, so I feel like I take bad photos sometimes and some people do because because it's so small and convenient, I'm tempted to like put it in stupid places to take my photo. And then like, yeah, I got to move on with my life. So I post that photo photo anyways, but like, I know that it's dumb and it's not, that's not how you take a photo, you know, and you would never do that with your SLR. So uh, there's just probably a lot of ways that the SLR would make you take better pictures. Yeah. And actually most of them aren't even SLRs anymore. Oh yeah. Just like the, the, the most I don't even really now. Oh, okay. Yeah, oh, that's right. Yeah, yeah. The last one, our our newer Rebel is probably like five years old, and it's still, like, you know, the, the the Rebels are still SLRs, but yeah, no, mod, most of the cameras people are shooting with now are mirrorless. Like uh, all the Fuji are mirrorless, all the Sony's are mirrorless now. I don't even know if Sony makes their old aim out stuff anymore. I they might, but I don't think so. Okay. Canon is basically switched entirely to mirrorless. Nikon is mostly switched to mirrorless, I think, as well. So yeah, I mean, it's. Yeah, they're mostly all mirrorless stuff, but they're essentially the same. They're very similar. As large, just different. The viewfinder is is different. There's a, and there's not the lens reflector that's not there anymore either. Um, you get all, now that mirrorless technology is caught up, you get much better. Like the viewfinder is way easier to use than for most people than the optical viewfinder on a nice. on an SLR. So yeah, kind of off topic, but I've always wanted a Leica. <laughs> Just because they're cool. Like, I don't yeah, even know what I'm going to use it for. But yeah, this is really cool. Dummy expensive, and you can take better pictures with a, a decent, you know, Sony or Canon. But they're, uh, they, I mean, everybody's talking about the dull quality. It's like, like, as, like again, part of the, what you're paying for is like the dull quality, but you're also paying for like the experience of doing everything manually. But you could also just do that with a, you know, a $200 film camera. <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah like my yes, you like this look cool yes they do yeah yeah it's purely driven by like the nostalgia and the look of it like <laughs> you can get like actual vintage cameras that are less money than like that's what, that's, what, that's always a funny thing oh funny. Too funny yeah well hey man we could talk for a long time but uh it's probably 
good that we start wrapping it up. I yeah. have one final question for you. You're, okay. We're going to go go a little philosophical with this one. All right. Um, so has this hobby, Amakaji, and everything that goes along with it, including the photography and stuff, um, and now, you know, your wife, Allie's into it, has this, you feel like, changed you as a person in positive ways? I mean, I thought about this the other day, actually, and I was like, I wouldn't be the same person without this, um, because that's such a huge part of my life. And like I said, like my wife is into it to the degree she is now too. Um, it's definitely changed stuff like that. Um, yeah, I think, and now I'm not saying I wouldn't have gotten some of these lessons without this, but I do think I've become more like uh, self-critical in a positive way. Like I've learned to look at the mistakes I've made and like, incorrect things that i've said and learned from them and i've learned to be a little like, i know it's hard to believe but i'm a little bit less forceful in like some of my opinions and stuff like that <laughs> um thanks to what people have shown me in this um i do think i've learned more about like ethics of manufacturing obviously and that's kind of brought me into learning more about ethics of like political things and uh you know other stuff beyond just clothing you know uh ethics and politics and stuff like that so yeah i do think it's helped in that way as well um and i think i've learned i learned this in college too but again i'm learning it even more in this is like to learn about different opinions and all that kind of stuff and to respect different ways people do things and that kind of thing um because i've kind of had to um which is again why i don't regret like being so strong with my opinions because that's how i learned that stuff like if I just sat on the sideline and said, oh, everything's great. I like all of this. Then you don't learn anything. Like, I don't, I, it was the thing is people think, oh, Jake always has to be right. No, no, I, I, I don't feel like I, I always want to be correct by the end of the conversation. That's the way I like to look at mm. stuff is um, I will, even if I believe, like I, I act like I'm right at the beginning of the conversation, I often will change my opinion by the end of it um so but like if you don't start the conversation then you won't learn anything you know what i mean like i've learned a lot um by putting my opinion out there and then i oh, finding out i was wrong later on right it's like okay cool but i learned so yeah but like i think there's a lot of people more and more now in this scene that like want to have dialogue and discuss things and are willing to learn there's a, i think that's gotten better in the scene than it used to be i think um so i feel like i've gotten better at it too like, so, I just, so i think that's kind of cool yeah that's awesome um if we're gonna take a wild guess we'll, we'll look back at this and see if we're right so if you were gonna just take a wild shot at where you think this whole hobby might go in the next like 10 15 years I make a prediction what would maybe one of those predictions be well i it's not going to die because i think the internet has stopped any hobby from dying at this point that's kind of the good and bad things about the internet is like nothing will completely go away at this point you know <laughs> there's always like it's one of those things like you realize like if stuff probably never died it's just that like now all those little pockets of people that were into stuff have been connected now and they realized there was more people right i think that's kind of the thing um so even if it got smaller it would not go away completely i think there's always going to be people now that are into this sort of thing where it goes i think what will happen is you're going to get more subgroups popping up. I think you're going to get even, you're going to get more of like the vintage heads or like the, like the, um, like the, the people that, you know, like the 1930s, 40s, like, you know, railroad worker cosplayers, right? You're going to get some, actually some more of that. Um, and you'll get more of, you know, the skinny jeans, modern streetwear. I think there'd be more of that. 
I think it's just going to be, I think none of the styles are going to go away. There's always going to be the Viberg fans. There's always going to be the Red Wing fans. I think it's going to be all the different little niches within the niches that we have now, except for probably more will even pop up somehow that we don't know about. Um, and each of them will be a little bit like bigger, I guess. That's what I think. Um, maybe the skinny jeans fad will finally go away just because that does kind of always does go away like through fashion like the skinny jeans thing does go away eventually might not though it might it might not i think there's always gonna be those guys that want to show off their boots um so they think skinny jeans are the way to do that so maybe that won't go away completely i guess because the internet stops trends from time i thought skinny jeans were going to go away years ago um but because of the internet i feel like that's what's stopping them from going away because i can tell you that like uh Gen Zers don't mostly wear skinny jeans. So, like, trend-wise, it's not a thing anymore. So, yeah, I think it's just, like, we'll see, like, an, maybe this, like, you'll have, like, more division between each of the different styles, maybe. Like, uh, we'll all be aware of them, but, like, you're going to have each of them, and they're going to be divided more. Like, like, okay, you're this style, you go and you hang out with these people. Like, I don't know, I don't want that to be a thing I like, I want it to be more blended, but I think it might like each style will get more like amplified and like bigger. And then you kind of find your spot and then you go there. That's when I think might happen. But I'm not just, like strongly like feeling that either way. I think I have no idea, honestly. I think we're, I think, I think we're going to ride the vintage repro trend a bit further. Um, and then that won't be the, I don't know how if that how much more dominant or not that will get. Like if Standard and Strange keeps, you know, being the main influencer in the in the scene, which they are right now, um, then that will keep happening. I think, but we'll see. Yeah, good. somebody else will come along and do something like who knows? Watch let, let, let watch Capital become like the biggest brand like in a few years, and like <laughs> everybody wants to wear Boro everything. Like, <laughs> could you imagine? Oh, like, what man. if, like, super Western wear got huge? Oh, I can mean, see that. Especially because yeah, you got, like, uh, Free Note, who has, like, a relationship with Standard and Strange. You know, people mm -hmm. like that. They get bigger and bigger and bigger. And, yeah, next thing you know, everybody's got, like, Western Americana kind of stuff. So, yeah. yeah. 15 years long, we were in bolos. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Yeah. Well, yeah, no pressure to be right. But, like, I'm just think it'd be fascinating if yeah we look back in a few years and see if some of these predictions are right or wrong or i don't like think so right. but it's yeah, just we'll fun see. to talk about it yeah, it's totally fun yeah so cool well man it's been great talking we'll definitely have to do it again sometime and you know obviously catch you on the, the instagram and all that but uh sure. man thanks for coming on it was an absolute blast every single second of it so thanks, man. i appreciate it thanks for uh inviting me on and yeah. of course i had fun always fun to talk to you yeah totally well you and Allie have a fantastic week we will. You too. All right. Take care. Take care.